We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Salam alaikum. Bonjour. Buenos dias. Hello and welcome. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet. And this is not a workshop. It is not a panel. It is a Friday hangout at IGF. So if you are watching on YouTube, if you are watching on the IGF platform, if you are on Zoom with us, or if you are part of the technical team or the captioner, or if you are sitting in this room with me, this is our session. We have 55 minutes to hang out and discuss digital inequalities. But today we want to zero in on the gender digital inequality. In other words, the digital inequality that concerns men versus women, not only in binary terms. I will have people who will contribute, but if you're listening to me, I will also love your contribution. Once again, it is not a panel. It is not a workshop. If you are here, you are part of the team. There are people online, like I said, there are people on Zoom and there are people in the room. Our session is in three parts. After you hear my welcome, we would want to hear someone who has worked with a group of researchers to inform us, especially about results coming from your research in West Africa. And then would want to hear some of the people who've contributed to that research. And we will hear from everyone else. Once again, this is not a very big session. It's a town hall session. A town hall session is the one where mothers come with their children and children are followed by their dogs and cats. So if you have a cat that wants to say something, they are welcome to this session. I don't know how the captioner will do it, but all pets are welcome. All researchers are welcome. All human beings are welcome. And even if you're not a human being and you can speak, we would like to try that today. Once again, welcome to the session. I am going to be inviting Ana Maria Rodriguez to the session. Anna, in the next five to seven minutes, can you please enlighten us on what research is saying about gender digital divide and what it means to us and what it is costing us as humanity? Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Nena. It is a pleasure for me to be here today. I'll be sharing with you um, our latest research from A4AI on the cost of exclusion. So before hearing from um, the amazing women in the panel about the concrete actions um, that um, they could take in South Asia and um, Sub-Saharan Africa to close the digital gender gap, I would like to contextualize the urgency of the matter and tell you about this research that we did in A4AI. Um, what we did is, in this amazing and powerful research, we, what we did is try to put a number uh, to the digital gender gap and understand what's the cost of excluding women from the internet and what's, what are the consequences, not only for my gender, uh, but also for men and non-binary people of not closing the digital gender gap, because this is not only a problem for women, but also for everyone in the economy. 
and it's affecting and it's making us lose billions of dollars uh, for keeping women offline. So it is well documented that uh, women are disproportionately excluded from internet use. Um, worldwide, 55% of men are connecting to are using the internet, whereas only 48% of women are using the internet. So this is what we know or what we understand as a digital gender gap. And, um, <clears throat> and in, the, in regions such as Africa or Asia Pacific, the situation is even worse. So we know that, um, we know this gap affects around 300 million women. 300 million women are not connecting to the internet. Um, we know it exists. We know how many women are affected by it. We know um, this uh, gap is very significant in regions such as Africa and Asia Pacific. But how has it be behaved in the past decade? What we um, found in our analysis is that this digital gender gap, gender gap hasn't closed in the past decade. It has actually remained almost the same it has only closed 0.5 percentage points. This is very little. And this shows us that policymakers and different stakeholders are not doing enough to close that digital gender gap. We studied 32 low and lower middle income countries, and this is what we found. So um, uh, as well, every two years, we do the affordability drivers index, and we have a gender indicator there. And Cons consistently, that indicator gets the lowest scores, um, and almost half of the countries that we include in, the, in that analysis don't have policies that include women and make them uh, connect to the internet. So we know this gap exists. We know that it hasn't changed in the past decade. We know we haven't closed it. But what's actually the cost? What's that in economic impact for the whole of the economy? Well, from our, our analysis, we found that this gender gap um, uh, is equivalent to a loss in economic production of 1 trillion US dollars in the past decade. So over the last 10 years, the whole of the economy of these 32 low and lower middle income countries that we studied have lost a total of 1 trillion US dollars due to a gender gap because we are not connecting women because they are not able to experience the whole power of the internet and um, get all the social and economic potentials of connecting, we as an economy are losing this amount of money. We have lost this amount of money. So this is the past. In the last decade, that's um, how much we have lost, but it shouldn't be our future. We encourage policymakers to work towards closing the gender gap. And we actually calculated that there is a big economic opportunity for these countries and these economies. Um, if they manage to close the gender gap in the next five years to 2025, they will have the opportunity to get an economic production of half a trillion dollars. So we encourage policymakers to act now, start taking steps to cl towards closing that gender gap and actually take advantage of this huge economic opportunity that closing the gender gap offers not only to women again, but men and non-binary people and all of us. So um, we have been working and advocating for closing this gender gap for many years in the Alliance for Affordable Internet. And what we recommend is using this policy framework that we call REACT. So five elements, rights, education, access, content, and targets. Um, the one, the rights uh, is that we should recognize the internet as a human right uh, for men and for women and recognize that women have the right to access it, to access devices and an affordable and meaningful connection. Education, for us, education is the foundation of all this. If you don't have the right digital skills or literacy, you won't be able to participate in the digital economy. So we encourage um, governments to work on this aspect. It should not only be the ICT sector that should work on this. It should be um, 
an, an effort of many sectors, including the education sector, including these subjects in the curriculum and also working with women so they can um, be more involved in the digital economy. When it comes to access, uh, we encourage as well policymakers to include in their policies aspects of affordable internet, many times offer free access and um, give them the right devices for them to connect. When it comes to content, um, we have been hearing many sessions around how to make the internet multilingual, how to make it relevant for everyone and not only for it's an internet many, many, many times designed by men, but we want women to be included in the design, but also to find the right content, content for them to participate. And lastly, we encourage um, to have the right targets, the targets that are um, easy to measure, easy to follow up, um, transparent, and to collect data as well, because there's a lot of missing data that we don't have, and we don't have the right instruments to understand um, how's the situation in low and lower middle income countries. From our research, we have had the opportunity to talk and we will hear more from the amazing uh, women that are here today sharing this panel with me. But we have been able to identify different experiences in Nigeria and India, for example, of what are women doing when they connect. And we have found that they, have, that they are able to do amazing things when they connect. They are able to impact not only their economic and social well-being, but also their children, social well-being, and their whole communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. What exactly is one trillion? That's a thousand billion. Is that correct? That's a lot of money that we've lost in the past decade. All right, thank you very much, Anna. What we want to do now is to hear from the wonderful ladies who have supported this research, who are women in ICT themselves, and who would um, enlighten us the more. And so ladies, I'd like to welcome you but not to talk to us about the report. We are going to read the report. Um, I am hoping that A for AI will tweet the link to this report so that even if we're not in this room, we can get access and read it more. But please let's note that 1 trillion is the money we've lost. So we know that amount. Um, now, what I would like to ask you, beginning from Audrey, who is in Abidjan, then Tokwe, who is in Lagos, and Nila, who is in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and one other lady who will come in, Amrita Verison. And so the three ladies would, we would like you to share with us, how are you living with this kind of challenges on a daily basis? One challenge, one way the women are dealing with this gender digital divide on a daily basis in your home country, in your home city? And what one thing should we be doing in policy to make a change? So the question once again is, how are women and girls overcoming this divide? What are they doing? How are they doing it? With who are they doing it? And what social and policy interventions can help reduce the digital gender gap. I know that in your study, you've spoken to a lot of these women, you've spoken to communities, you've held focus groups, you've gone around your countries, you've heard a lot of stories. So we are not able to listen to all your stories, but we'll give you three minutes each to enlighten us on one story that you know on the how and one other on what we should do next. Audrey, Tu as la parole. Welcome. Can we unmute Audrey? Thank you, Nina. So, um, from my experience as a researcher in Cote d'Ivoire, I can say that um, the main barrier, the, the, the woman and girl, 
are faced about the, um, the digital uh, gap, uh, um, the level of education, the, the wage gap, and also I can say the, the lack of the cost of device. And um, some lady tell uh, that internet are not affordable for her because the, they don't get uh, they don't get a lot of money, so they can't pay for internet. So this is one of the barrier. And uh, many women are sure about privacy and online security. And um, mm, last year, for example, when we went to Waké, it is a, a city of the Côte d'Ivoire. Some lady uh, said that they don't have the right to access to internet because the housebound don't want them to have access to internet. So, so sorry, ma'am, can you repeat that? I said the lady uh, did not have a right because the husband did what? The, the, the husband said they don't have the right to access to internet, yes. And many times they don't have money to pay Usually it is a man who pay for internet. It is a man who pay for everything. So if your husband said, you don't have the right to access your internet, you cannot have the right because you don't have money to pay it. So it is one of the barriers. But I will focus on one point, the level of education. Um, I see that inadequate women are not afraid to use internet because they use internet to develop their business. Whatever you can see in agriculture, informal sector in general, they try to create online activities, even if someone else can help them. If they don't learn how to write, they don't learn how to, to, to read, they can use voice te technology to talk with their customers. So if they are inadequated, they can use internet to develop their business and make money. And um, uh, some lesson I learned from last year to now, I think, uh, if you, you come from Cote d'Ivoire, you come from Benin, you come from the Burkina Faso, it is the same lesson I think we can put to, um, uh, to close the digital gender gap. I can say, um, for example, the government can uh, improve the service for women online. When I was in the small town in Cote d'Ivoire, the lady said, we would love to uh, maybe access uh, with internet, we can uh, buy something, we can um, have health assistance via internet, we can, um, uh, how can I say that? We can um, order food, we can order uh, anything else with internet. Two years ago, we need to travel two hours or one hour to go in the small city to access to the bank with them, for example, with mobile money, with a digital uh, bank online, we can access to our money and buy anything we want in a minute. So we don't need to uh, take a lot of time and Thank you very much, Audrey. Amrita has arrived, but before Amrita, we want to listen to Tokwe Ogundipe, who I believe is in the big fat African country of Nigeria. Tokwe, you are welcome. What's your experience and what's your advice in three minutes? Can we uh, unmute Tokwe, please? Thank you. Can you hear me, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm not. Uh... 
I think I may keep my camera off because of sporty connection. Um, right. Yes. Okay. So um, thank you again. So the experience in Nigeria with this um, with this research was was quite interesting. Um, what we are finding is that um, the digital gender gap um, continues to, in my experience, um, deepen or widen, especially in rural communities. So um, we had initially thought that the interviews were going to be virtual and the focus groups as well. But we increasingly found out that it was not going to be possible to speak to certain categories of people who are living in rural areas without electricity to charge devices, without access and connectivity. And so we had to have uh, some of the focus groups as face to face to be able to speak to these women. Um, what we also found that was uh, quite interesting from group, group to group is that um, the reasons or the motivation for connecting to, to the internet possibly vary from, from different, for different demographics of women, depending on where they are living and what their priorities are. So for instance, we have thought that in Nigeria, the um, younger women might be more interested in the internet generally for socioeconomic opportunities, for education, for business. Um, we found that younger women are possibly more interested in access to the internet for, for communication and social networking and for issues around agency much more. And then the older women who we found with less digital skills, um, who are less confident about uh, the, the, the use of the internet, they really wanted to learn for business and socioeconomic opportunities. That's what we were, uh, that's what we we're finding. And this also differs, uh, um, we also found that this, this, was, uh, this was also different from one geographical location to another. So the, the, the more we moved up north, um, the more we found that people were more interested um, in the internet for what I would call agency. For instance, what Audrey was talking about, um, people, people want to be able to own devices as, you know, just to start with, to be able to um, have access to data, um, you know, with their own funds, which was often scarce, um, you know, but in the South, more people had devices, um, even if we found that some of those devices were not smart devices, they, ha they had devices, they had connections to one degree or other. One second, Tope, one yes. second. So the North, there is a North-South divide does yes. it follow the rural urban divide? And which side is rural and which side is urban? So we understand. So for instance, in, uh, in the North, we spoke to both, we, we spoke to people both from urban and rural communities. In the Southeast as well, we spoke to people both from urban and rural communities. In the West, we spoke to people both from urban and rural communities. But in the North, we spoke to younger women only. But in both the Southwest and the Southeast, we spoke to um, women from about 18 to 60 years, just uh, the whole range. Um, so, um, but in the North, like I said, it was more of women looking for agency, women looking to even connect in the first instance. They wanted um, access to their own devices. They wanted to have agency. They wanted, they didn't want to share devices. Um, and they were very interested in communication and social networking. Um, in the south, in the southeast and southwest, people were looking for more meaningful connections. So they had devices, they had internet, they had connection, but they, they wanted skills, they wanted opportunities, they wanted um, to be able to find information that was relevant, you know, to, to them, to their context, to, to civic engagement, to political participation, um, and to business uh, and job opportunities. So that's, uh, that's what we were finding. Um, we also found that the pandemic had, um, had um, encouraged a lot of um, a lot of people to to, to explore online opportunities, um, but the barriers that they were finding, you know, were related to costs, exorbitant cost of data. Um, it was related to trust. Um, you know, the environment in Nigeria is such that the trust in the online space is very low. People are afraid of being scammed. Um, cyber fraud is very popular. So um, as much as people are moving online, they are also inhibited in terms of 
um, uh, business participation and, and, and what they're doing online because of trust. And another okay. big problem. Okay. Let, let's let's circle in on the trust yes. the issue. What policy and social measures do you can you recommend uh, in dealing with the trust and online security issue as seen in your research? That would be helpful to us. Yes. So, uh, in terms of dealing with uh, trust issues in Nigeria, I think that. Um, what, what may be very um, important is um, to for policy around for policies around uh, cyber security to to focus on consumer protections and also um, confidence in the online marketplace because um, we find that there is that, that there's not enough collaboration I think between um, stakeholders in the space for prevention of um, online fraud. And uh, I do think that this is something that sets back significantly the digital economy. So um, I think that one of the policies that can work in that area is for uh, public and private partnerships to address um, issues of confidence in the online space and, and stronger protection for, for consumers. So I think that that's one thing that can be done to, to in, in, in that space. And then the second thing that I also think may help is still on the issue of education and digital skills. Because even when there are um, people who are new to the internet space often do not have enough knowledge and confidence to make the choices that will protect them in the online space. So um, people are buying and selling and using applications, but they are not the, the cho their choices in terms of um, data protection or who has access to their personal information. They're not making good choices. They're not using all the all the controls that are at their disposals. Their privacy practices or their online hygiene generally online hygiene practices are not good enough again because the skills are not there so i think right. in skills training it's beyond this is the internet and this is how to use it it should also um, include skills that can improve confidence in how people protect their data and personal information in the online space right you've been very helpful to us talk and everybody is nodding in this i wish you could see how many nods so it's not a plus is no plus if we can see us and mary uduma is here um, she's nodding in agreement i'm going to come to nila so we're moving from africa to asia buckle up folks there may be some turbulence on the way but we are heading down to asia nila you are in bangladesh what have you seen and what do you want to tell us can Thank we you. unmute nila achia yes yeah yeah, you can call me Nila. My nickname is Nila. Thank you. Actually, uh, in this is research, what we face, uh, the thing is, uh, last uh, nine years I'm working in this field. So the I what I discovered, the thing is, uh, firstly, the uh, access to device is a problem. Access to tech education is a problem. And access to digital um, financial support also is a problem, so like, like financial uh, transaction. And also cybersecurity is a big problem in here in Bangladesh for the women life. So there's a lot of problem. So the thing is uh, people are not getting the proper education. And uh, in Bangladesh, every man, uh, every family actually by lead by man and men own the computer or own a, a electric device or any type of smartphone. So when uh, any uh, women want to use that, they need to uh, take permission from the men. So that, that is a problem. And another thing is the broadband connectivity is not everywhere available. So they need to buy the mobile data. That also a problem for the women because they are depending on the uh, their husband, fathers or brothers. So they always ask to money for the buying the mobile data and that is expensive so access to internet also a very much problem for them and uh, in pandemic time one thing we discovered there are there are lots of women they come in the online business 
but that is only based on social media business and uh, we didn't get any digital money transaction over there so the thing is they are uh, taking water from their connection uh, personal connection and they provide the service but then after that when they deliver the product they just take uh, uh, they make a system like cash on delivery so uh, there is a nothing in digital so the, the, there is a trust issue, oh, so they are still there is a gap. Actually, the main thing I discovered the thing is uh, there is a huge skill gap. So people don't know how can I use my skill in, uh, in internet or how can I access the internet and if I use the internet, what type of problem I will face and what type of support I will get from the internet use. So there is a problem and financial problem is always there. So uh, because uh, all Asian women depends on their uh, family lead like the man so that is why uh, that there is a problem and uh, in when we are uh, com, uh, talk with the business women especially uh, those who are running the tech business and e-commerce business they gave uh, uh, gave us one thought that uh, if you can uh, just uh, add a, a good uh, women friendly policy for, because all over the world, everyone, every woman facing this problem. It's not we are living in a developing country. We are facing this problem. This is not true. All over the world, women are facing the same problem. So people thinking women are not good in the technical thing. So so they uh, told me, may, uh, if you can uh, suggest uh, write in your uh, paper like uh, we need the actually strong policy for the women uh, and uh, a small policy for the uh, uh, how they uh, how can how they can um, you uh, access the access uh, easily access the internet actually so and also the pricing issues so uh, they Nina, want yeah one second let's zero in on the uh, financial and entrepreneur capa digital capacity of the women yes. we want to understand when you're talking about policies that help women do better in business. Can you enlighten us the more? We know about the husband issue. We know about the finance issue. What mm -hmm. is it technical skills? Is it security? In what, what policy are we adopting that will help women? That would be helpful to us as we capture the notes here at IGF. Okay, so one thing actually we also discovered about the skill gap. So uh, the girls, they want to learn the technical things and but there is a problem. So they are not able to access the schools where uh, we teach the technical knowledge. And another thing is they are not getting support from the family. That's why I'm talking about families uh, because there is a mindset. Uh, the parents think uh, uh, girls are not good in the um, STEM education, so they send them the arts and uh, other education. So there is a problem. So there are lots of girls interested to come in the technical industry, but uh, there is a skill gap and they are not able to access that. And uh, when we are talk with the young generation, especially like uh, 19 to 24 or 25, uh, they gave, gave us one insight about the cyber security. So uh, some uh, girls, they come in the cyber world, but they don't know how to use it. So there is, an, uh, again, skill gap. So mostly the thing is we can discover uh, there is a huge skill gap. So we need to work on that. And also uh, the thing is that like uh, in the uh, when we, um, in, uh, we are trying to introduce a new thing in the industry, then we need to give them the proper actually education about that, like uh, uh, how they use the internet uh, the, uh, regarding the cyber issues and how they uh, use their business and also uh, when they are working in the online, what type of problem they will face. So they, uh, everybody uh, highlight these issues to me. All right. Thank you so very much, Nila. There is a member of parliament in this room, Nima. Um, I hope you're listening to us, you from Tanzania. I'm going to come round to you because you have to speak to us now. The only, mem the only government person we, we have here, we're going to hold her ransom until we hear from her. <laughs> but Amrita, you're welcome. Amrita, so we've, we've seen the, the, the skills challenge. We've seen the husband challenge. We've seen the family challenge. We've seen the infrastructure and the, and the business opportunity challenge. 
Uh, we've even seen the myths around women not being able to do well in, in STEM. We've seen a lot of that, but we want to hear from you. Uh, by the way, where are, where are you? And what have you seen? Please hop on. We want to hear from you, Amrita. And uh, my apologies for being late. Um, I am in India. I'm close to Achia. Um, so whatever has been said so far and what your report mentions, I would say a plus one to all. But I would like to suggest something that when we were looking at this entire story, if someone had been looking at this issue two years back, the story would have been different. And the story today is very different. When we spoke to, uh, you know, we looked at two cities primarily because of the pandemic, uh, two places, I would say. Uh, we looked at uh, people between different age groups, um, women of different age groups, 18 to 27 and 27 and above, and socioeconomic group, uh, you know, those who earn a particular amount and less. So um, what we found uh, is that due to the pandemic, everyone has been pushed online. They are pushed because you know there, there was a lockdown. People had to use mobile money. Their ch children had to study online. So they were pushed into the digital environment, whether they liked it or not. Even if it was a very poor person, you know, a small tailor's wife or you know, anyone for that matter. Obviously, it depended upon the devices. And I think it was spoken that if there is a shared device, the husband gets first, the children get the second priority to study, and the woman gets later. But when she had to shop for vegetables and had to pay for the vegetables, she needed the mobile to make the payments. So that is how they were pushed into it. Um, so I would say that while there is a digital gender gap, which is very evident, but uh, due to the pandemic, many people have been pushed into it. Whether they are able to access everything they want or not, that is a different thing. That is a concern, whether they are getting meaningful access, but they have been pushed into the digital world. They understand that it is, uh, you know, digital economy or, uh, you know, doing transacting online or doing things online has become a way of life. Now, what we found is, uh, you know, you were asking the question um, sometime back as to what do women need to do businesses online? They understand, many of them whom we spoke to, understand the power of being able to sell online, even from social media companies, because it's become very easy, you know, having a store in Facebook or even, um, you know, so we found many of them who are doing all this. Uh, what we found, and one of the particular person whom we spoke to, is that the groups, uh, you know, there are various organ social groups, uh, even from government or even, uh, you know, semi-private or private, who actually help them get the skills or help them to get the higher skills. There was a lady who was running a, fl a flower business, a florist. Um, when she went online to do transactions, etc., and she wanted to grow her business more, there was, there was an entity who actually helped her to skill herself and an organization with which she uh, associated, which helped her to increase her market. So what happens is they also realize that when they go online, when they start transacting online, it helps to, um, you know, get them network, reach out to greater, uh, more, uh, I would say, diverse places, get more opportunities, uh, and, and become more resourceful. Um, we also found that while women are using internet or using the services on the internet, you know, it's not internet per se, but it can be social media, but other uh, activities, they would want it into in their own local language. Today, most of these services, when they start, it may be in a local language, but when it comes to the payment part, it is in English. Mm -hmm. So that is where the challenge comes. So the end to end, if it is available in a local language, it becomes easier for them to understand and uh, you know, actually do. The other thing which we found across all the discussions and across all the um, kind of people, strata, socioeconomic, or even cities is, women are concerned to place their own opinion online because right. they will be scrutinized the trust deficit on the internet is extremely high 
Um, so that is where perhaps there needs to be some work. We found that though, you know there are government opportunities to help women entrepreneurs, um, and there is a focus on it. Those, uh, but it needs to be um, the information of those opportunities need to go to all people. Those who get it are able to avail it and take opportunity of it. But those who, but um, you know, it has to, I would say, permeate and spread more. Um, because there are facilities which are being given. So um, I think that is something which needs to be done in terms of policy. While we have a lot of policies, I think the implementation of policies is important. Enforcement of those policies um, is important. And uh, I think it is more to do with capacity building, reaching, you know, governments may say that, okay, we want to help women entrepreneurs, we want to, have, you know, make them empowered and, uh, you know, youth empowered, etc. But are we making this, the environment empowering is a question. Empower it, the women, but have an empowering environment as well. Is that correct? Yes, there has to be an empowering environment. And are there checks and balances to see if the environment is empowering? You know, the government may have a lot of vision, but is it going in the right direction is something which is important. All right. So I'm going to come to Honorable Nima Lugangira. So finally, Tanzania has a female president and heavens did not break down in Africa. You, you, you need to remain there. Does she need to remain there for the camera? Okay. So Nima, or if you can move around and move, move up to the front. Yes, you're on your way to, to presidency. <laughs> so you're from, you're from Tanzania. Tanzania is a wonderful country in Africa. If you recall, um, there was the president and the vice president who is a lady and the president traveled beyond the digital world and the vice president stepped in and was effect, is effectively the president of this African country. And she's a Muslim woman, she's doing great, and nothing bad has happened in Tanzania. That shows that women who have agency can go all the way. But then, uh, Nima, that's why we are not here. We already know that Tanzania has a female president. But then um, you, you, have, you hold postcards, You've been very active on, on Twitter since you were here. Your voice is being heard. My question to you, having listened to all of these women, the husband issue, the skills, the agency, um, educating women, creating conducive environments. My question to you is, how can we have more NEMAs in Tanzania and beyond Tanzania to India, to Bangladesh, to Nigeria, to Cote d'Ivoire, as you've been listening? What can we do? And what can you as an MP raise our voices? How can we raise our voices to the level that they should be heard? Um, thank you very much. And um, like, like you said, we, uh, Tanzania went through a very difficult patch where our sitting president um, passed away. But I think we've also been able to demonstrate that we're a mature democratic country in the sense that there was a shift to power and uh, we now have a female president, Her Excellency Samia Sulu Hassan, who fortunately is very, very committed to the ICT sector. And she has a huge ambition of developing center of excellency um, in ICT, et cetera. Um, now, when it comes to this topic, I think the biggest challenges they are is um, oftentimes digital development initiatives take place in the urban areas or commercial cities um, in most of our developing countries, at least I know in Tanzania. So they'll be happening in Dar es Salaam or Mwanza, Arusha, the big cities, leaving aside the rural, rural areas. Um, so that's one of the main things that we need to focus on is to put, to bridge the gaps in the rural and, and to do that, you need the rural connectivity. And I was actually very pleased in the earlier session that we linked the issue of connectivity with electricity. Because most of the times we forget that in order for people to be online, you need electricity. So when we're talking about the rural connectivity is to try and get you know, more people connected to electricity and people to also be online. But then there is the other issue of economic 
you know, what is the price of the data for people to be able to afford? What is the price of buying the smartphone? Because all of these things hinder the, the participation. Um, then there's the issue that everybody else has spoken about digital literacy, digital skills. But I think to do all of that, we also need to bridge the gap, the digital literacy skills gap of policymakers. Merci many... beaucoup. Asante. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think often in all of these discussions, we forget the policymakers. You know, we can have very good research, very good findings, you know, very good plans and everything. But when it comes to implementing or when it comes to the requirement of doing those policy reforms, you need the policymakers to have an understanding. So perhaps my call to action can be how can we get more policymakers on board? And I've already seen I myself as a parliamentarian here from Africa. I kind of have a responsibility, and I think all of you will be able um, to support me on this course to try and get more African parliamentarians on board this agenda. And to do that, so I'm hoping to be able perhaps um, through the partnerships with all of you to identify some potential parliamentarians from different African countries who can, um, so that we can create our own network and be capacitated such that we are then able to take what's being discussed and translate it in our own countries and make that enabling environment. Because at the end of the day, all of this needs policy. I think that's the biggest gap that I see policymakers. There is a reason we call our MPs honorable. Honorable, thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so very much. I do hope that the organizer of this panel, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, will take these into consideration and put them down uh, so that we actually have um, a network of um, parliamentarians who are working on this and especially the gender digital gap. I'm going to pick on another lady on a personal note because uh, we've not gone to South America. So buckle up, we will fly from Asia. We will land somewhere in South America and Europe. Marielza, yes. Can you pick up the mic and let us know what you think? Come on up, yes. Come on up. She is from the country of um, Brazil. There was a lady president there. There was. Who signed into law the famous Marco Civil. Yes. So Marielza is from the country that was a pioneer in digital rights with a woman president. I think we're having a great session out here. Marielza, what's up? Well, well, first of all, let me say that it's the first time that I actually address a woman now. I'm usually part of the, you know, the, the token woman in a manner, you know, so <laughs> this is incredibly fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, well, I have to echo the initial uh, uh, study that was, was made, you know, on the losses that uh, digital uh, divide, uh, uh, the gender digital divide have created. And to add $17 trillion to that loss, uh, we just concluded, you know, uh, um, I'm from UNESCO, we just concluded uh, a study uh, with uh, UNESCO, UNICEF and the World Bank on the losses of um, future earnings from the generation that was excluded from education, you know, because of the closures. And it's $17 trillion, majority of which is exclusion for girls and young women simply because they could not access uh, online learning. There was not sufficient connectivity. There was not sufficient skills and capacities on the parts of uh, teachers, schools, and education environments to offer them, you know, a meaningful education so that they can continue their learning process. So, seventeen trillion dollars. Think about this amount of money. That seventeen million, you know, uh, thousand billion dollars, you know, in a generation. That's a tremendous amount. And, and out of this money, can you think of how much investment, you know, uh, how much smaller the investment to connect everyone meaningfully would have been to avoid this tremendous loss? Mm -hmm. This is unacceptable. You know, we're just throwing the money out the window instead of putting it in the right place. You know, so that's a terrible thing. 
I also want to mention the work that we do um, on uh, journalism and protecting women journalists. Safety online was something that was mentioned by you know, all the other you know, uh, speakers. And I just want to mention that uh, when we surveyed women journalists, 73% of them told us that they suffer harassment and abuse online, and 20% of them actually said that the uh, harassment and abuse online translates into hum uh, real world abuse and harassment and threat. So that's, uh, you know, it's a terrible thing that women cannot, you know, exercise their profession online without being victims of this kind of, uh, of, uh, of cyber crime, you know, which is essentially, you know, uh, uh, how it should be treated. Okay. Uh, so just, uh, you know, to, to conclude, you know, uh, on the, on, um, on the question that you talked, you know, that you mentioned, um, that you asked about, um, um, that, that, that uh, some of us uh, uh, here were talking about in policymaking. The first thing I think that we should be doing is looking at ICT policy to see if it really is including gender issues in the policy making. And if they are not, then of course, building capacities of policymakers to actually think in terms of the divides and the gaps and where they are and what we need to do specifically to address the gaps that exist. So, I mean, this is a fantastic discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Rochelle is our captioner and we want to say thank you for the work you've been doing. I see you. You've captioned in English and in French. Thank you very much. Someone here came in quietly and thinks that I didn't see her. She's, she organizes the Women IGF in her country, been a MAG member, is the chair of the Africa MAG, Mary Uduma. What have you heard? You've been along with women. Um, you've been there from day zero. What can we do? What do you have to tell us? Ma, come right up here. Okay, all right. Yes, you are fit to be a president at this time. <laughs> you are, you've done enough. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, uh, I just want to say that uh, I want to echo all that we have said here. And I want to paint a picture. We went to do, we, we organized a sub-regional, a sub-national IGF in one of the cities in, uh, in Nigeria, in the north. Interesting. So, so when we went for that IGF, sub-national IGF, the women, the, the women had to paint a very ugly picture for me to say that I'm not helping. Why are they still not there? A woman had posted her picture on, on, uh, on uh, Facebook and she was divorced. Because she Hang on, a, a, someone was divorced because she put up her photo on Facebook. That's it. From and the husband is still free and moving around? Oh, the husband is free and moving around. Why not? So that's one. The second thing is that some women don't even want to hear internet because it is bad. It is devilish. It is uh, anti-culture because of her culture. So they go, they don't want their children to even touch the internet. One woman told me, Madam, we don't like the internet. It is bad. It brings a lot of uh, bad, bad behaviors to our children. Our children learn the wrong things from the internet. So what am I saying? Empowerment of the women by educating them rightly in their own language will be very, very important. The second thing is that there are some women that even if you teach them, they don't want. Um, they don't want to be part of your teaching or skill building or anything. There are some that are, you know, that, that are catching up and doing more things like we had the, 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 uh, the report from Nigeria. But there are some of them in Puda. They cannot, you can't see them. And so how do you reach them? Please, you need, what, what is Puda? Puda <laughs> that is those that are not, the women that are not to be seen, they are in their husband's house. It's only their husband that will be seen. If you get to their family, you don't see them. You, they cover their faces. 
So he took another woman who is in Puda to get to them, an enlightened person. And that's how they built a trust. Is uh, a has um, you know, you know, Akim Ajijola's wife, you know, Akim Ajijola. So he took her, they, they, they had trust in her to come in and speak to their women, talk to them about internet. So we can also look at the influencers, who are the influencers that could influence uh, some of the things we want to do. So social and yes. cultural yeah, influencers, influencers yes. who can reach to this women. Yes. Right. Yes. That's a very important point. We have five minutes remaining. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. And thank you for the work you are doing in Nigeria and with the women. We are privileged to have the executive director of the Alliance for Affordable Internet. Um, we have five more minutes. We are not calling on you as a woman. We, we've had enough women here, but we are calling on you as the ED of uh, the A for AI. You convened us here. We would like to hear a few words before we wrap up. And before then, I'd like to say Amrita, thank you in India. Audrey, thank you in Abidjan. Tokwe, thank you in Lagos, Nigeria. And Nila, thank you in Dhaka, Bangladesh. For those who do not know, I'm also a woman, just so you, you know. I also want to have my own voice heard. And I live in the same city with Audrey. It's called Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire. We speak French in that country. And one, if you can see that Audrey is one of our exceptional women because she can express herself in English. It is not all of our women that can express themselves in the number one language of the world, as people have said. The language factor is something. The cultural factor is something. We've talked about the husband factor. Some people who live in places think these things are very light. If a woman is in Puda and only the man can speak for her, if the woman is financially enslaved, and can only have access to that which the man says she can have access to. So her access level is becomes subsidiary to the desires of her husband. And access or not becomes a measure of, of um, sovereignty of the husband. So while we are talking about di national digital sovereignty, please add husband digital sovereignty. I don't know if that exists, but you people who are doing research will note that. Um, earlier on, we spoke to someone in this room who doesn't want to pick up the mic, but who is a student who was a student in Warsaw, but now in Katowice is studying online. This happens everywhere. Women's lives are being affected by connectivity. And so while we express our thoughts in this town hall meeting, we also hope for better ways to make women comfortable, secure, and meaningfully connected. Because we cannot be losing money as a global economy because our women are either not connected or not meaningfully connected or are not safe and secure when they get online or that our lawmakers do not understand the need to take care of these problems. It is hopeful that this town hall session will help us advance in our thinking. And when you see someone that says that a woman cannot, please say, I met a woman MP who is doing things. I met a woman who is doing one or two things and please give them the names of women who do wonderful things. And so we are going to hand over to the ED of A for AI. Um, please come and give us your blessing anyhow you want it. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Nina. You're very, you're very kind. Um, you don't need my blessing. What I want to say is that this discussion is just uh, a really wonderful representation of not just the incredible diversity of views, but at the same time, the similarity of challenges that women face across the world. There were so many identical uh, concerns that were raised by Amrita, by Audrey, by um, Neela, and all of you here in the room. And I think what unites us here, I guess that's also the, the 
theme of IGF this year, but what unites us here is really our uh, commitment to change and our commitment to not just gender equality in general, but digital equality. And so I want to say also that I am so proud of our team. I'm so proud of Anna's presentation and the work that she's done and that she shared with us, Teddy, Carmen, Nene, you, and all of our friends and partners that are here, including Mary, Nima, um, Marielsa, and more, uh, that we are here because we care. And there's so much more work to be done. But we are not tired. We just think we are tired. We're going to continue to work hard, to fight the fight, and continue to really do work that we hope will change the world. And I think that's really important. So I just want to say from a positive note to me today, it's yet another moment of inspiration, but also such pride for not just working with all of you amazing people that are fighting the fight that is that needs to be fight in fought in the world but also the fact that we are not going to give up and next year we're going to be here and throughout the year we're going to work together to change these pictures so the next time when Anna presents again another of our amazing research projects that she'll be leading with us uh, we'll have more progress than the 1.6 than you mentioned in your presentation. Right. So let's hope for that. A lot of work to be done. And thank you all for being here. Thank you to those who are being who are online. Also engage with our team, reach out. And if you are doing work that is relevant for this area, let's bring it all together and support each other. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And Nena, you are a star and you are wonderful in bringing us all together. This is a true town hall. Muchas thank gracias, you. senora. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you to our technical team. Thank you to everyone. 16 days of activism may be winding down. We may still be oranging the world, but then keep it up there. There is digital equality. There is gender equality. There is digital gender equality. My name is Nena. I come from the internet and I wish you a great weekend. Cheers.